All right, so let's get started. And uh, well, this um, I remember the last in-person meeting I, I, I've been to in North America was uh, the Wasm Summit at Google campus. So, you know, and this is the first post um, pandemic conference, in person conference I can, that, you know, uh, I went to Asia in the middle and attended a bunch of conferences, but this is the first one in the, um, in the US. That's so glad to be back and glad to er finally see everyone face to face. Well, so let's dive right into it. What we are talking about in the, in, in the first is why, you know, why do we need, um, uh, uh, you know, manage, you know, why do we need to manage WebAssembly in Kubernetes tools? And this is a um, uh, picture I, I often use for, um, you know, I like to use this. I didn't draw that. IBM OpenWhisk drew it. And it's talk about the evolution of, you know, uh, cloud or server-side technologies, right? You know, so it come, start from bare, bare metal. And I, you know, I still remember the days when data centers have you know your own dedicated servers? You know you uh, you do the iris scan or do the fingerprint scan, go there, and you can actually find where your software is on those servers. That provides you know um, use hardware to isolate software, right? It's provide a level of abstraction, and then virtual machine come along and become cloud and become containers, and now we are at the um, at the new age of deploying functions. You know um, to me. Uh, I think, you know, um, um, as Rolf had said and Liam had said earlier in, uh, in, uh, early today, that this represents a new level of abstraction. You know, it's the abstraction, the, the separation from infrastructure code to the business logic code, which is something that uh, people on the server side on the back end has always strived to, right? You know, so I, I think to have, um, to have the infrastructure completely abstracted away and for developers to only write functions is one of the um, a major step forward. So I think this is, um, you, you know, one of um, you know one of the big um, the context of, of my talk, right? You know, so uh, so what we have is this this mask and said serverless. Why do we do serverless? Is we want to make servers great again, right? You know, so uh, I have this here, and uh, if you guys want it, I have quite a few. You know, so it's uh, <laughs> so everyone wants it, go and get it. <laughs> That's. Uh, um, so we want to do serverless. You know, the reason we want to do serverless is to, is to make server-side programming or back-end programming easier. However, there are still dark cloud on the horizon, to be, so to speak. Is that to say, you know, people say, you know, uh, today most serverless functions or, or, or function as a service functions are implemented using what we call micro VM or Docker-like containers, right? You know, so um, you are um, essentially running the, the function inside a um, an inside application container. And just to think about um, the work you have to go through to run a, a, a function. Say the function is 1020 line of JavaScript code. You have to start Docker or the micro VM and start operating system in it, start Node.js, and run 10 lines of code, and then shut it all down, right? You know, that's a, it's not a very effective way of using system resources. And uh, um, so here are two graphs. You know, again, those are not mine. Those are, you know, when people have done the measurement. Um, you know, um, when, when Datadog presented this graph to say half of Lambda functions finish less than 800 milliseconds, uh, my reaction is really half of the Lambda functions took more than 800 milliseconds. You know, that's, uh, uh, it seems very long. You know, it seems, you know, 0 0.0 seconds. You know, that's, uh, if, you, uh, if you are into the, uh, you know, Jamstack application paradigm, you know, that's that sort of thing. You'd think, you know, each web page would have 10, 20 different microservices on the back end, and it's take, you know, if each one of them should take us, Take a second. It's it's a, it's a very long time. So even with what we call mega cloud in uh, in super sized data centers, we are still you know um, um, you know facing the problem of code start and things like that, and that spells problem for um, having the serverless paradigm available everywhere in you know um, on the network's edge and on edge devices. You know so. Um, even in today's mega data center, we, we have problems. So you know that's um, um, so we want to, we want so what we want is a is a lighter application container or something that is uh, that is significantly smaller and faster than doc, than Docker like application containers to run those lightweight uh, functions. So we don't have to go through all the process of starting Docker, starting operating system, starting Node.js, and run run everything right. So. Maybe the answer is WebAssembly. You know, that's that's why we are here. That's why we have a cloud-native Wasm day, right? You know, could 
WebAssembly become um, a container, you know, so at a the time there's, um, there's talk on the internet to say maybe WebAssembly is going to be replacing Docker or become next Docker. But it's probably not, you know, because WebAssembly as of today or maybe for a long time wouldn't provide the same kind of developer experience that Docker would give you, which is give you an operating system and you can do whatever you want in there. However, um, what we think is more likely to happen is to have WebAssembly running side by side with Docker. So you would have, a, a, for lack of a better word, a service mesh or something like that, right? You know, that's uh, uh, is something controlled, by, um, is something that is managed by, say, Kubernetes or you know uh, some other framework, and it can start Docker for some uh, workload, and it can start WebAssembly for some other workload. It depends on what kind of workload you have and where do you want to deploy it. So this is the main focus of the talk: is to use WebAssembly as a container, Web, use WebAssembly itself as a container, but not to replace Docker but to go where Docker cannot go or Docker is too heavy to go, right? So, so I want to tell you a little bit about what, you know, uh, you know that's, uh, um, uh, you know, what is a framework or what is a tool, you know, this is a shameless plug for, for the project I'm involved in. You know, it's called Wasm Edge, right? You know, that's, uh, um, it's a web, it's a web assembly runtime that is optimized for high uh, um, uh, you know, uh, cloud native applications. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about why it makes Wasmage um, such a good fit for, um, for microservices or, or, or as a serverless container. So one of the, uh, one of the key features it has, it has LLVM based AOT, so it's, it's one of the fastest, I wouldn't say it's fast, the fastest because you know, there are different workloads, different VMs have different characteristics. But in a lot of benchmarks, we come up top, you know, so it's one of the fastest WebAssembly VMs on the market with AOT compilation. And we do uh, custom extensions because, you know, when you talk about things like you want to run it as a microservice, you need networking capabilities inside the, uh, inside the VM. So to have network socket support is a must have. To have asynchronous pooling is a must have, although WebAssembly doesn't have uh, multi-thread yet, but, you know, so does JavaScript. JavaScript doesn't have multi-thread either, right? You know, so, um, but JavaScript support asynchronous as we our experience from Node.js finds out that that is, um, you know, appropriate for a lot of use cases. So have a synchronous um, polling and have things like, you know, uh, AI inference like uh, co-op to TensorFlow and to have database connectors and things of that nature. And one of the other things that we put a lot of focus on is to provide um, uh, first-class JavaScript support. You know, I think uh, we are reaching a consensus from multiple talks today, you know, from, uh, from the Shopify talk and, uh, you, you, you know, it's that, or we want to compile the JavaScript runtime into WebAssembly and then run JavaScript inside that runtime. And people keep asking why. You know, why do you do that? Don't, you know, isn't JavaScript already runs in some kind of runtime, you know, isn't Node.js and V8 designed for that? It, yes, it is. You can run it in V8, but V8 is never designed as a container, right? V8, if you, uh, you, you don't run V8 naked, you run V8 inside Docker. So the, the role of WebAssembly is WebAssembly plus a JavaScript runtime replaces the Docker plus operating system plus Node.js plus V8, right? You know, so that's a, and uh, by having a lightweight JavaScript implementation, uh, um, by the way, the work we have done so far is also based on QuickJS because QuickJS is an easy to understand JavaScript implementation. We can provide ways for WebAssembly to supplement JavaScript, meaning that we could have JavaScript APIs but implement it in Rust, right? You know, so in, um, so in your JavaScript application, you may want to do something like image processing, but instead of, you know, um, um, you know using uh, interpreted JavaScript to process the image, you could have a Rust function on the back end to provide this functionality, pretty much the same way you use C++ functions to, to extend V8, right? So, you know, so, so we, um, so Wasmage provides a lot of, your, you know, those uh, JavaScript support, we, um, I'm gonna give you a link later in the talk, you know, to, um, to talk about those. And then there's management features, which is um, the, the focus of the remainder of the talk, is that uh, we made Wasm Edge an OCI compliant uh, runtime, meaning that it can, um, it's, um, it, it can be managed by system D and uh, uh, C group FS, you know, meaning at the process level, you can allocate resources to it. And there was also an excellent question early in, in today, is to do we have finally, um, you know, more finely grained um, you know, resource allocation for WebAssembly runtime because WebAssembly runtime are lighter, so you may not want to, um, you know, just provide 
um, you know, uh, resources at the process level. You may want to provide resources at the threat level, right? You know, um, this is a page we borrowed from the, the blockchain people, which is what they call gas meters, right? You know, that's uh, essentially you give each WebAssembly opcode or instruction a gas value, and then say, when you start this VM, I would allocate, uh, say, a million gas, and then for, uh, you know, then it would compute um, um, how many instructions it went through. After it's exhausted all the gas, it stops, right? You know, so you can even get people to pay you based on gas. They can pre-buy those gas as credits, and then, you know, and then use that. You know, this, um, um, we, have this, um, we have this gas support built into our, our, our C API, Go API, and the Rust API. I believe Wasm Time also have it. You know, it's, uh, um, uh, if you look into their Rust API, they actually have something called, I forgot the name. They, they didn't call it gas, but, uh, it, but it's a very similar concept. So those are some of the um, unique features that what I, uh, what I would say that um, made, uh, made Wasm Edge you know, um, uh, appropriate VM for cloud native applications. Well, I skip the use cases, so we can go right to how. You know, how we do that, how we make a WebAssembly workload run side by side with Docker workload in Kubernetes cluster, right? We have three approaches, and some, of, um, you know, uh, I, would be I would mostly focus on number one because this, uh, because this is the approach that we took. The, the other two approach, approaches is, is one that you have heard from the end group. They have a WebAssembly runtime that manages, I think the last time they told me, it's 500,000 machines, 500,000 machines in their data center, right? You know, that's, um, and they use ContainerD shim. And then there's um, um, the, the excellent work Microsoft have done with Crosslet, you know, but the, uh, the way we did it is that we have, a OC, we made our entire runtime compliant with OCI. So what does it mean? So what does what is OCI compliant runtime? So this is, I think you know, maybe all of you are very familiar with this graph, right? You know that uh, you have Docker and Kubernetes at the top, and then you have a, a container runtime in, in interface, it's CRI, and underneath that you have different runtimes, and uh, um, it all goes down to um, a couple of you know a container runtimes called run C, typically run C, C run. You know that's. Uh, um, and from those, uh, from those binary applications, it actually starts the container, right? It's, uh, this approach is actually not unique to us. You know, a lot of people have done it. You know, so there's run C, which is a Go-based container runtime. It means run container. And then there's C run. It means C-based run, you know, C-based container runtime. And there's run E. You know, it's a SGX-based, you know, um, um, a zero-knowledge proof, you know, um, the trusted uh, computing environment uh, container runtime. And then there's Kata runtime, there's GVisor, there's run SC, you know, there's a bunch of those, you know, so, 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 so people have, um, you know, um, as a community has innovated to, um, to change those runtime, uh, to change those runtimes to make them run different workloads, right? You know, so, so some of them are application containers, some of them are not, and run application containers in different places. So the work that we have done is to, um, is to fork C run and uh, um, 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 we, you know, and we are trying to merge it up, uh, upstream, but but still in the process of that, right? You know, so um, so the work on our side is mostly done. It's uh, we call this tool C run W, and there's a GitHub link there. So it's uh, it's based on C run, but it's uh, it has some logic in it to detect whether we are running a Docker container or we are running a WebAssembly uh, image. If it's a WebAssembly image, it's load the you use the OCI interface to load to load the WebAssembly image and then run it. Right? So it's C run W means it's based on C run, but runs WebAssembly. Right? You know? So it's uh, um, like I said, it utilizes the the the, the CRIO and the Kubernetes extens extensible architecture. You know, Kubernetes and uh, um, CRIO are both set up to allow you to add your own custom runtimes. So instead of using CRUN, we replace the CRUN binary with our, um, with, with our build here. That allows, you know, that's um, because this, this is the drop-in CRUN replacement. It runs um, um, Docker containers just like CRUN does, and it also runs WebAssembly. So it allows us to run Docker and WebAssembly side by side in the same, uh, in the same clustering environment. And, uh, um, up, and then up from that, you, you know, you have, um, you know, um, you would be able to use, um, 
you know, store web, uh, WASM files, WebAssembly files directly in Docker Hub. So it's with all the Docker semantics would work. You can pull the image and then you can start and you can run, right? You know, so, so that's, and it uh, supports the resource allocations through um, uh, C group FS and the system D. Um, there's, a, there's a video, um, which I don't think we should um, uh, play it here, but um, you know, it, it, it goes through the whole process because as we know, anything related to Docker and Kubernetes take a long time to demo. You know, that's, uh, you, know, you have to show, you know, download this, download that, and then, you know, and then resolve this conflict and that. So, you know, um, but I, I walk through the, the main steps here. So um, from the first part, you can see this is, uh, um, this is to create a Docker image. The Docker image has no operating system. It just has a WebAssembly file. That is um, the OCI compliant, so to, the, so to speak, OCI compliant WebAssembly application that being packaged in the container format and it can be stored and pulled from the Docker Hub, right? So we publish to, to, um, to Docker Hub. And then we use the uh, uh, CRIO um, uh, command line tool, it's CRI, CRI CTL. And we can pull that from the, um, well, before we get to this step, we have already replaced the CRON binary in, the CRI, uh, in our CRIO uh, uh, installation with our build of the CRON W binary, right? You know, so, so there's a slash bin slash CRON, and we replace that binary with the binary that we have built. Um, you know, uh, to make it be, uh, to make it aware of the different type of um, you know contain, uh, container images, right? So we can just do things the way that you normally would do with Docker images. You can pull them, and uh, you can run them. You uh, you can create a pod, and then can you, you can run them, and it would just uh, you know start the container. It would run that WebAssembly application. That WebAssembly application happens to be. A, um, a WASI application that reads something from the command line and then generates some output, print out through the command line. And you can see all the results in the logs, right? You know, so, so that's an um, that's e easy way to test it, right? You know, so that's, um, um, with that modification for the CRA, you can, um, you can try it with Docker images and you can try it with WebAssembly images and both of them work, right? So now we go to the next step, we want to build um, you know, we want to use this modified CRIO to build a Kubernetes cluster. However, in order to do that, we need a, a WebAssembly application that is long running, meaning that we need a WebAssembly application that in itself act as a microservice. There's no Docker around it. There's no Docker or another host application around it. That WebAssembly application, when you, when you start, it should um, listen to the network and respond to the network. That requires us to support um, the WASI socket um, specification. And the WASI socket specification, as I understand it, um, has been fairly slow. So, um, you know, uh, different teams have come up with different ways to do it. You know, that's, uh, um, um, that's what we did as well. That's grows out of necessity. That's because we, uh, because we need to uh, have this run in the Kubernetes environment. So we, 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 we must have, a, um, um, you know, a, a microservice that can listen to the HTTP network. So we have, uh, so I'm gonna demonstrate two ways to do it. The first is just to, to, use, uh, to use our Rust API. And uh, uh, because this is not a W3C standard, so, it's, uh, um, so we can't just uh, you know, use the standard Rust API to create a network connection or socket yet. We have to, um, as you can see, uh, we have to import um, WASM Edge WASI socket for the TCP listeners and TCP stream and you know, things of that nature. But once you have it, the, the, the main application become fairly simple. You know, you, um, this, this looks just like, you know, uh, how would you write a, a web server in Rust, right? You know, that's, uh, um, you know, you open the port and then you say, listen, listen for it. And uh, the, the, um, the function that does the work is, is called handle client. And uh, the code is here, you know, this, those screenshot is, um, is, um, is as the entire application, you know, the entire application just have this much code, right? You know, so if you look at the, the uh, handle client, it basically, um, you know, um, uh, gets the input HTTP and uh, um, pass out, you know, um, decode it and pass out different elements from it. And then it generates a response. And this response is basically just to echo back the, the body, right? You know, so if the, the, the post request has a body and then, you know, um, uh, from the command line, it would just, um, from the command line that you run the server, it would just echo back the, uh, it would 
just uh, it will just echo it back. So that's um, um, a very simple Rust-based um, HTTP, uh, HTTP server that runs inside Wasm Edge, and that allows um, uh, we, that allows us to have a long-running Wasm Edge um, uh, instance that can be managed by Kubernetes, can be started by our modified version of Ceron, right? Ceron W. And then the second way to do that is probably what um, most people would do. And as I think we heard it again and again today that people want to use JavaScript, right? Especially Java developers, and especially web developers, they want to use JavaScript. So the way we did is that um, in our in the in the JavaScript runtime that runs inside Wasm Edge, we uh, we we used um, like I just said, we can use Rust to implement JavaScript APIs. So meaning that we can define a JavaScript API that is available to JavaScript developers, but when, when the JavaScript program calls it, it actually calls the underlying Rust program to execute it, in, all inside the Wasm Edge, right? You know, so taking that um, um, you know, um, Rust-based SDK, we can make it into um, a JavaScript API called HTTP server. So this, um, so all the, all the Rust code becomes this couple lines of JavaScript code. And uh, so it's just a start H, um, uh, HTTP server. And then, you know, um, and for the sake of simplicity, I'm, I'm, I'm showing it as, a, as a, a blocking example, right? You know, so it's just an infinite loop. It keeps getting the request, and once they get the request, it's sped out of the body. And uh, um, it's um, in the... Um, yeah, so, um, but I also said there's, uh, there's, another, uh, there's another work that we did with WASI is to support asynchronous pooling. So we can do that um, um, in a way that is asynchronous, both using um, JavaScript async or using Rust futures. So both of those are, uh, are supported as well. But, you know, um, here we are, we are um, you know, um, showing a very simple JavaScript example. That's only, I would say, Less than ten lines of code, twenty lines, ten lines of code. You know that's uh, and uh, it's uh, it it starts a container as you know it's this experience goes very similar to it strongly reminds me of the old days of Java, right? You know that's when you have a JVM, you use JVM to do an application server, you do exactly this, right? You know that's uh, but you know that's uh, um, well you. you you know, I think this is what uh, enterprise software demands. You know, that's uh, um, so we are we are evolving toward that stage at WebAssembly as well. So, so on Kubernetes, um, once we have the CRIO set up and uh, um, the the C run in CRIO set up, and also the um, the um, web uh, Wasm Edge based microservices that is long running set up. We can now set up Kubernetes, and it's, a, it's becomes really simple. You know, you just um, in a standard Kubernetes setup, you can pass the argument say the container runtime, right? You, you put container runtime as a remote, and then put it in, point it to CRIO, or in Minikube, you know, that's probably easier to do. You just say, you know, container runtime is CRIO, and then it would uh, uh, find the the um, uh, the CRIO, the modified CRIO runtime on the on the pod machine and then start it, and then use that to go to Docker Hub or to go to a, a image repository to get the WebAssembly image and run it, right? Okay, so there are a couple of um, real world use cases, and in, you know, because I spent a lot of time in Asia, you know, that's um, a, 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 most of the use cases are actually from, from you know, um, uh, internet providers in, um, uh, from internet providers in China. So you know they are, they are leveraging like CDN networks to do distributed computing. So for instance, you know there's a, um, there are distributed CDN networks where they put um, you know those set up boxes into people's homes, and then they pre-distribute tonight's movies onto those uh, onto those boxes, and then um, you know because for each neighborhood you know um, the movies you're gonna watch are probably just that three or four. You know, that's so, so, so they would predict that and put that all that and put that on the box, right? You know, and from those boxes, they can, uh, they can act as a distributed CDN and serve a lot of clients. But that box essentially only has a, has a cell phone chip in it. It's a, it has an ARM, ARM, ARM 7 chip in it. So, so um, before WebAssembly, they used to run Docker on it. And this, uh, this device can run four Dockers. 
and uh, serve for big, big enterprise customers, you know, something of something of that nature, right? So now they can, um, with WebAssembly, they can run a lot more. So, so you know, so there are CDN network testing, and there's, um, you know, there are other, um, you know, uh, cloud providers that does uh, sidecar runtime, you know, that's managed by Kubernetes and doing service mesh using, um, um, using the work that we have done. So, well, so then, the first approach is our, our approach, right? And then the second approach really is run WASM apps at container D shims. That's what uh, one of the previous talk has, you know, has talked about, right? You know, there's, uh, um, you know, that's uh, Ali and, uh, uh, and and Financial has done that. So uh, I'll skip over that. And then the third approach, which I thought also was very, very interesting, is the cross-led approach. Obviously, we have uh, experts here, um, you know, people who have developed that, you know, so I wouldn't, Assume my ignorance, you know, that's, uh, so uh, if you have questions about cross um, you know, go, um, you, can, you can ask the experts. So beyond Kubernetes, you know, that's, um, so we now have uh, a way to run, um, what I would say, wasm workload in a Docker-like fashion in a Kubernetes-like cluster. You know, that's, uh, so beyond the regular Kubernetes, what are the other use cases? There are, obviously, there are quite a few Kubernetes variations for edge computing. And uh, I think uh, the, um, all three, the, there's four, the top three are all in CNCF today. You know, those are all what they call Kubernetes for the edge, right? Kube Edge, Super Edge, Open Yaw. And, uh, you know, and then there's KubeSphere, which is a, um, a private cloud Kubernetes deployment. And they, they are integrating with Dapper, Microsoft Dapper, and they are also, um, you know, uh, having their own function as a service. You know, so there's lots of innovations around this area. You know, that's, that's, that that's goes slightly out of the regular Kubernetes, but still use the same um, OCI infrastructure. So that's one of the um, um, areas that, that we thought our approach could be really interesting because that's, because um, uh, underneath of them, they all use CRON or RON C. You know, now we, we change that to CRON W. Right? And then, of course, there are, um, you know, um, uh, um, a service mesh. In service mesh, there are two strong use cases. One is just to use um, um, the WebAssembly runtime or the WebAssembly application as a sidecar application. You know, so the WebAssembly provides microservices itself, right? You know, so uh, we have an example that we have done with with Dapper. You know, that's uh, um, you know um, uh, there's, opt uh, there's a case study published that on, uh, on InfoQ, and you can look at that. And uh, um, you, you know, there's multiple ways to do it, how to integrate that into the sidecar, right? You know, that's, you can have a host application that uses sidecar SDK, or you have a, um, you know, um, a WASM Edge application running by itself. And then, of course, there are, you know, there's um, um, an active collaboration that we want to pursue are, you know, those sidecar runtimes that managed by Kubernetes, um, you know, natively managed by Kubernetes, like Linkerd, right? You know, those are the things that we are, um, you know, uh, we are very actively looking at, try to integrate. Then on service mesh, there's uh, other side of the story, which is uh, um, um, which is uh, the, the the traffic proxy. You know, so um, in the service mesh, you have you have those sidecars, but then you have proxies to direct traffic to the sidecars, right? And there's a growing trend. I think started from Envoy is to have is to make web uh, web assembly into a scripting language for the um, for the proxy, uh, replacing Lua, right? You know, so that's uh, so. Um, Envoy has a standard, it's called, um, you know, Proxy Wasm, and then it's being adopted by, you know, a bunch of other guys. So, uh, so this is also a very interesting area that, 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 that we find, you know, that's, um, it's, uh, um, it's not directly related to Kubernetes, but it's tangentially related, right? Then, of course, you know, um, as earlier speakers has also spoke to, you know, there's, uh, there's also a growing need to run WebAssembly directly on devices. Um, that's, um, you know, that's where uh, WebAssembly become really interesting because there's different implementation of WebAssembly. They all have different characteristics. Some of them are really small. That's um, like the earlier talk, talking about running WebAssembly on camera, right? You know, but uh, um, for larger systems, is, um, that's increasingly popular, for instance, autonomous cars or uh, smart factories, that's, um, um, they all have not regular Linux, but real-time Linux operating systems, and they all need containers. I, I think uh, Wind River, um, you know, the, the VxWorks guys um, um, published um, something called VxWorks containers, um, I think a couple of months ago. And uh, they were talking about using uh, container technology in fighter jets, right? 
um, I have seen Toyota using containers in their, um, using Docker containers in their next generation of cars. Just think about it, using Docker in cars. You know, that's the Docker controlling something as vital as autonomous driving, right? You know, that's, a, a, you know, in my opinion, this is, a, this is a, not a good fit. You, you know, there's a much better fit, which is, you know, that's um, a, to, have a, to have a much more abstract and, uh, and lighter runtime that's based on WebAssembly. So, so, so um, uh, on that ground, we, we, we work with a project, also Linux Foundation project called Cell4. And uh, um, that's, um, that's a formally verified um, 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 a real time um, a microkernel system. And uh, it's, uh, I think it's being adopted by quite a few you know, um, autonomous driving uh, companies and uh, you know, um, electric car companies. Cell is based in Australia. And uh, um, you know, its users are most, a lot of them are in Asia. And the US military as well. They, they, have, they put it on the, on, the, on the drones and you know, things like that. So, you know, so um, that is another potential. You, you, okay. <laughs> This is, another, this is another use case, you know, that's, uh, um, so, so um, not directly related to Kubernetes, but that's also something, um, when you run it in a, in a real-time operating system, you also need an orchestration solution. And uh, is Kubernetes gonna be, um, or a modified version of Kubernetes, or something else would be part of the, uh, would be part of the solution. It's also something that's, uh, that, that we are very interested in exploring. Um, yeah, so then, I think I pretty much covered that. You know, that's um, then there's data-driven orchestration. You know, meaning that you know we are not um, uh, thinking about computer instances, but thinking about a flow of data. You know, when data comes in, we want to react to it. You know, like Connor just said, right? You do a uh, create a reactor framework, and then you know, um, and and then WebAssembly becomes uh, becomes a reactor or becomes a reactive function in that framework. Maybe that's the way. You know, um, maybe that's the, the orchestration solution for a lot of those applications. So yeah, that's, um, I think I'm right on time. Yeah, so if there's any questions. Yeah. Hi everybody, so we're back here. Are there any questions before we move on to the lightning talk? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you mentioned that the, uh, the C run W, mm -hmm. Yeah, the upstream is CRAM. So um, we want to merge back to, to, to CRAM. However, as you might imagine, it needs convincing, right? You know, because you know, we, need to tell the, we need to tell the CRAM developers why you need to support WebAssembly. Right. So and, uh, we are trying to talk to them. Try to, you know, that's why we come to meetings like this, right? You know, try, to, try to get a consensus. <laughs> Make sure that's on. Uh, so uh, we're gonna go ahead and uh, have Oscar come up. But while we do that, so Oscar, go ahead. While we do that, while we're here, let's ask one or two more questions. Um, on the virtual stream, you may get cut off. I'm not really sure. But uh, so there was another question over here. Right, so the question is, um, how would a developer take advantage of the custom extensions that we baked into Wasm Edge? So um, for all the extensions that we have, we must first have a Rust SDK, then we, we attempt to have a JavaScript SDK as well. So for developers, um, you know, that's, in a way, it breaks the comp compatibility with Rust, um, with WebAssembly, because you know, once they use our Rust SDK to, uh, to build application and compile into Rust, it would not work on uh, another runtime because that another runtime doesn't have the host functions. But that's, that's also why we are here. That's why we want to standardize it, right? You know, that's uh, so, yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, go ahead and unplug and we'll.